Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this side event of the 61st session of the U.S. Commission on Narcotic Drugs. The title of today's discussion is The Rights to Science and Freedom of Research with Scheduled Substances. I would like to thank the government of the Czech Republic for helping us organizing it, and thank you very much also for the badges and, and all the facilitation. The organizer are the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, FAAAT, ISERS, Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access and Association Educa Cosione, of which Marco Perduca, I am the uh, international organizer. Uh, the debate we'll hear about uh, from, um, uh, we will start with a, a brief video uh, produced by Open Society Foundations that will tell us a little bit about where we are in terms of research and drugs. But then the discussion will start with the presentation on the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which will tell us of the existence of these rights to science and which uh, several UN bodies are discussed uh, these days. And we're waiting for a general comment to be published possibly by the end of this year uh, from Geneva. And then we will go step by step into some of the most promising research fields that will tell us not only what they've been doing, but the problems that they've been encountering in their daily work in some parts of the globe, because not everywhere there are the same laws and policies and regulations or the same attention uh, by institution and by civil society. Let's start with the video and then I'll give you Government support has led to many of our greatest medical discoveries. Cancer treatments, the polio vaccine, the mapping of the human genome. With such a wide reach, governments can push fledgling research into the spotlight. But, just as easily, they can sweep critical research into the dark. Which is exactly what started happening 50 years ago with the war on drugs. As Western governments cracked down on drug use outside the laboratory, they tried to control what happened inside it too. They began placing some substances in a special category. One for drugs considered highly abusable, totally unsafe, and most importantly, medically useless. But the decisions were political, not scientific. And substances thousands of scientists were actively researching. Cannabis, psilocybin, LSD, MDMA were categorized as having no medical benefits. That put scientists in a bind. To prove the value of these substances, they needed to research them. But government funding completely dried up, and all the red tape made it virtually impossible to carry out research. For 50 years, scientific progress has been dragged down. Research that might have led to treatments for everything from migraines to PTSD. It all got lost in a bureaucratic wasteland. 50 wasted years is enough. Urge our policymakers to end these senseless restrictions and let scientists do their work. Thank you. Perhaps we'll show it later also again with more uh, volume to the, the beginning of the video. I said the title of the event is The Right to Science. The Right to Science has been around since the early set of all. It's already enshrined in the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights, uh, but it was eventually uh, elaborated in the preparation of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And we believe it's like a sleeping beauty of human rights. Not many think in, uh, about science as, as a component of the human rights instruments. But there's a growing movement inside and outside the United Nations that is trying to address that. Uh, at the end of September last year, at the University of Turin, uh, the Luca Cosioni Association, together with many of the speakers today, organized the first ever event in Italy. I'm sorry, we are a little behind schedule on some issues, but at least we started uh, with uh, uh, a lot of presentation that tried to put together these two aspects, theory and practice. Because as you know, the three UN conventions were promoted to actually allow these substances to be available all over the world, and the result was the opposite. We ended up having a lot of problems also for the medical and scientific use of all those plants and their derivatives instead of uh, having them promoted around the world. So today we will start from the theoretical 
and then move into the practical. And the first speaker is Ludovica Pauli of the University of Turin. You have the floor for maximum, I would say, six and a half minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to provide my contribution to this panel with some preliminary remarks on the right of science. So while the roots of the right of science, as Marco already stressed, lie at the very foundation of human rights law, namely in the universal declarations on human rights, its relevance has only recently begun to be studied by human, human rights lawyers. Its contents are still debated, and its centrality in human rights discourse is very, very involved. The perspective adopted by international community towards science has changed during the years, as a quick look to the main documents dealing with science and human rights reveals. Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights provides the rights to the benefits of scientific progress and its applications, linking this right to the protection of intellectual property on the one hand, and to the right of everyone to participate in cultural life on the other. When the, draft, when the drafting of the Covenant took place during the 50s, the relationship between science and human rights was considered a positive and promising one, even despite a clear misuse made of science and technology during the Second World War. Science at that time was clearly conceived a key instrument to achieve other rights enshrined in the Covenant. For example, the full use of technical and scientific knowledge to improve methods of production, conservation, and distribution of food was explicitly mentioned as a means to realize the right to be free from anger under Article 11 of the, co of the Covenant. Additionally, even if Article 12 does not refer to science, the enjoyment of highest attainable standard of physical and mental health depends, in large part, from scientific development. As Professor Shabas has stressed, the right to science seems to be inextricably linked with the entire philosophy of the Covenant, namely the progressive realizations of the right to food, to medical care, to housing, and so on. The approach towards science has slightly changed, changed, uh, changed later on. During the 70s, science came to be seen as a possible threat to the full enjoyment of our rights. Documents such as the Declaration on the Use of Scientific and Technological Progress in the Interest of Peace and for the Benefit of Mankind, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1975, encouraged states to prevent the use of scientific and technological achievement to the detriment of human rights and fundamental freedoms and the dignity of the human person. Since then, the need for a human rights approach to science has found much more fertile ground for the elaboration at the international level than the right to science as such. So science and its applications were increasingly called to be consistent with fundamental human rights, such as um, non-discrimination, gender equality, accountability and participation. And documents such as the Oviedo Convention and the Universal Declaration on Human Genome and Human Rights demonstrate that concerns of possible adverse effect of science and technology have reinforced during years. It goes without saying that the potential threatening impact of science and technology over rights should not be underestimated. Science is not inherently good. Along with technology, science is rather a, ve a vehicle serving whatever values it is guided by, for good and for heaven. However, we have the strong need for a further elaboration of, on the right to science as such. Not only science and technology offer solutions to personal, social, and economic issues, but the right to science is, has also an autonomous standing among other rights that need to be recognized. It gives expression to human creativity and promotes the pursuit of knowledge and understanding in a constantly changing world. To quote a special rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, scientific development has a pivotal role in supporting the ability of people to aspire that is, to conceive a better future, which is not only desirable, but is also attainable. It's true that unlike other human rights, like the right to health, housing, or food, access to science and technology is not usually a matter of life or death. However, access to science shapes the kind of life, the kind of life, of life we live. Its inherent value lies in the idea of a dignified human life that goes beyond mere survival and security needs. So what we need is to combine two profiles. On the one hand, assuring human rights approach to science, so making sure that science is consistent with ethical and human rights standards. But on the other, we also need to stress the importance of the right to science approach. And to do it, we need to have a clear idea on what uh, we mean for enjoyment of the benefits for, say, of scientific progress. 
So, for example, we need to keep in mind that benefits of scientific progress encompass not only scientific results as such, but also the scientific process, its methodologies, and its tools. Additionally, we have to remember that enjoyment encompass implies two different issues. First, enjoyment implies the dissemination of the outcomes of the scientific progress, as well as scientific access to scientific knowledge, even in the form of science education. As a matter of fact, access to scientific knowledge is exactly what empowers people to make informed decisions. Second, enjoyment implies participation in the scientific development, which encompasses not only freedom of research, which is obviously a key issue, but even, to use again the word of the special rapporteur, opportunities for all to contribute to the scientific enterprise. Much is still to be done to concretely implement the right to science. First, to identify a clear obligation bearing upon states. Second, to deal with challenges to a full realization of this right. And third, to guarantee its enforcement. But agreeing on the inherent value of the right of science is the first step in the right direction. Science tells us something about what we are. So let me conclude with the word of a beautiful poem by Robert Browning. Progress, he says, uh, is man's distinctive mark alone, not God's, not the beast. God is, they are. Man partially is and wholly hopes to be. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ludovic, also for keeping to the six and a half minutes. Uh, it is something that NGOs don't do. They, uh, which, no, 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 I'm mean, not keeping to the six and a half It's usually they do if, uh, if the chair is good. So I'll try to be as good as possible. What is, was mentioned before, it's an instrument that NGOs don't use. Whenever the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights meet in Geneva, they study the way in which member states report on a variety of issues, including science. Not a single government, not even Switzerland, and uh, I, I'm sorry to point out Switzerland because they usually do the best of the best, tell, I'll say in a line what they're doing about Article 15 of the Covenant. So our new next job would be to call on our governments to do that and perhaps go to Geneva to double check if they actually do it, how they do it, and how the committee responds to that. So we move now to Spain. I will never remember by heart what ISERS means, but that's okay. Because I think. Center. Right, there you go. For the Botanical Education Research and Service. Thank you very much, Constanza. Yeah. But the speaker today is Jose Carlos Buzo, who will speak about barriers to research in plant medicines in the confines of Western science in person and the importance of non clinical research. Jose Carlos, you have very much. I will stand up. <coughs> the presentation. Uh, first of all, I will do a, an overview about how are the different barriers that the research is from and we will just start some research, and then how these different kinds of research can be applied to the study of traditional medicine. That is something that we are working in our institution, ICIRS. Well, uh, the evidence-based medicine and the double studies for the cell. The first time that the clinical the randomized clinical trials are considered as, as the gold standard for evaluating the efficacy of biomedical interventions was in 1962. And with this uh, ITO, observational studies, like by example historical clinical trials or case control studies, etc., the clinical experience of the medical doctors and the evidence coming from other disciplines as anthropology are now they substituted by randomized clinical trials. The primacy of the hierarchies of evidence concur the biomedical science. But there are also some other struggles that can be just bureaucratic. For example, the um, European Union regulation was, was approved according to which drug used in clinical trials must comply with good manufacturing practices. And this regulation ended with independent research in most European Union countries and institutions because of the costly of drugs manufactured according to genetics. This is one of the many examples that we can find in the literature regarding the different hierarchies of, of evidence and the difference of standards in the field for research. From my point of view, the first one may be political ideologies. Besides that the treaties recognize that the use of narcotics and psychotropic substances 
for medical and scientific purposes is indispensable, and that the availability for such purposes should not be unduly restricted, there are governments that restrict the scientific research with controlled drugs. But there are also other uh, different obstacles, by example, scientific ideologies. Hierarchies of evidence is unscientific. There is any single evidence that says that controlled clinical trials is the gold standard to consider the evidence of uh, biomedical treatment. So hierarchies of evidence should be replaced by accepting, indeed, of embracing a diversity of approaches. Bureaucracy is another obstacle, and your European Union regulation was approved according to this draft using clinical trials, must comply with good manufacturing uh, practices. And for, for example, uh, in our case, we are start, trying to start a study with the cocaine, and just the encapsulation and quality of control based on TBPs for a pilot clinical trial with the cocaine for the toxification of methadone for 20 patients costs almost 40,000 euros. So these uh, costs of the different uh, <coughs> medicines that can be used in the European Union in clinical trials was the end of almost all the public independent research. Public policies is another obstacle because public agencies rarely give funds to projects that look for positive results of scheduled drugs. But at last, if you have money, you can, in some way or another, from or, or past these different obstacles. Uh, we have several uh, examples of how some medicines are not necessary to pass all these uh, processes of phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, post commercialization phase, etc. For example, the, the example of cannabis uh, in 2014, the report of the INCP. Uh, establish it, what are the control measures applicable to programs for the use of cannabis uh, for medical purposes uh, according to the single conventions on narcotic drugs. And nowadays, we can find in almost all the uh, countries, in almost all the continents, states where uh, programs with cannabis medicinal have been initiated. For example, in North America, we have a program in Puerto Rico. In United States, there are at least 25 states that have this kind of medical cannabis program. In Canada, of course, in Europe, the Czech Republic, or Germany, or Italy, or the Netherlands, uh, in Asia, Israel. You can find uh, all the different regulations uh, regarding uh, uh, medical cannabis in this webpage. So, we have a fair example of how it's not necessary to go to the normal regulation in order to have or to see a proof of medicine for medical purposes. The other example is the cocaine. The cocaine is an alkaloid that came from a, a plant that uh, grows in, in uh, equatorial Africa and uh, is well known for its anti adaptive <coughs> effects. Uh, this day we are talking about this crisis uh, opioid. Uh, we know that in the U.S., for example, every uh, day died between 19 and 120 persons uh, for overdose of opioids. This epidemic is also reaching Canada and even the European Union. And yesterday we thought that also in some countries like Ghana in Africa and, and so on, uh, the, the opioid crisis is increasing. And there are several evidence. There are no controlled clinical trials, but there are other kinds of evidence, open level clinical trials or, or case series studies, where uh, have been that hypocaine may be quite useful in the treatment of opioid dependence. And today there are at least four countries, New Zealand, South Africa, Gabon, and Brazil, where there are uh, where ibogaine is allowed for medical purposes without the necessity of doing all these controlled clinical trials. In fact, we have another project in Brazil using ibogaine for the treatment of, of alcohol dependence. And the last case that I want to mention is CBD, the nabitoid, that is one of the active principles of cannabis, one of the uh, main cannabinoids of the cannabis plant. And again, uh, the regulation of CBD was not because uh, CBD passed all the different phases in clinical trials, but because of the society or any side, uh, parents with children that have 
epilepsy, another, another disease. Uh, at, at last, they, they were able to change the laws in order that CBD was uh, allowed for medical purposes in many parts of the US, uh, also in Brazil and also in other uh, countries of the European Union. And at last, I, want, I would like to mention a special case of traditional medicines like ayahuasca, yoga, <coughs> or peyote, psychotic medicines. Uh, I mean, the uh, World Health Organization has this program that is the World Health Organization Mental Health Gap that said that uh, it's necessary to uh, invest resources in the development countries in order that people that have uh, mental problems could uh, have access to uh, good uh, services in order because these problems in mental health could be uh, something that is not uh, uh, facilitating the development of the country. So the uh, W has this mental health action plan in which they said that it should be also uh, promote traditional medicines by, based in uh, scientific evidence and also in human rights. In fact, uh, the W has also this traditional medicine strategy in which it's trying that medicine, uh, traditional medicines can be recognized as uh, medicines that could serve for uh, traditional uh, cultures. But it, as you will know, it is impossible to obtain evidence in order to uh, obtain recognition of these traditional medicines if we go to the controlled clinical randomized clinical trials, because you cannot go to the Amazonia and give to the Sherman a placebo, ayahuasca placebo, or an artista ayahuasca, and so on. And in these traditional medicines, it's impossible to differentiate the, the principal active or, or the medicine from the culture. Everything is the same. Is the same. So we need that other kinds of evidence can be recognized in order that at last traditional medicines can uh, stay inside of these programs that the World Health Organization wants to be recognized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Um, everybody knows Natalie Ginsberg. She's a force of nature, and she is also the reason why we're all here around this table. So, twice we have to thank you for this. She works for the brighter force in the world, which is MAPS, which has been doing incredible work. And we will hear about MDMA and barriers with drug development model, history of UN encouraging more MDMA research after scheduling and then all the barriers that, that cannabis has had to uh, face in uh, in the United States, according to this. You have to Thank you. She's sick, so <laughs> yeah, we, have, we have to be quiet. That I'm really excited to be here. Um, so MAPS, is, MAPS, which stands for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, uh, was founded in 1986, just after um, MDMA was first scheduled. Um, and I really appreciate Jose Carlos um, speaking about the importance of non-clinical randomized trials and of um, expanding the system. But MAPS's approach, for the most part, has been to try to use these clinical randomized trials um, with psychedelics and specifically MDMA to demonstrate their therapeutic um, potential kind of in the wake of when they were first criminalized. Um, and to tell just a brief, um, short history of, ha of how MDMA was first um, scheduled. Um, MDMA was actually developed by Merck Pharmaceuticals in 1912. And in the 1970s, it gained popularity being used in therapeutic settings um, when it was a legal substance. And then in the early 1980s, um, someone decided to market it and call it ecstasy and target the club scene and use skyrocketed amidst the escalating war on drugs in the United States um, and the DA moved to schedule it. And following the U.S. scheduling, um, the WHO followed suit. Um, but interestingly, there was little minimal research um, to support the scheduling. And in fact, they relied on research from a similar but unrelated, a similar compound called MDA to, for the scheduling. 
And a quote, this is a quote from the WHO's 22nd report of the Expert Committee on Drug Dependence in 1985. Um, and I think it's, in, it's particularly interesting because at the end, the last bit says, the Expert Committee urged countries to use the provisions of the Convention on Psychotropic Substances to facilitate risk research on this interesting substance. Um, and yet, they have done little to actively promote this research. And MAPS um, is privately funded, conducting privately funded research. But thus far, the only uh, MDMA research that governments are willing to invest in is that um, trying to um, discover harm rather than um, seeking therapeutic benefit. Um, MAPS, however, in the past over 30 years, um, has worked to develop a number of different psychedelic assisted <coughs> therapies. Um, and our main focus is using MDMA assisted psychotherapy to treat post traumatic stress disorder. Um, we also conducted studies for using MDMA therapy <coughs> to treat social anxiety in adults with autism. Um, and anxiety in, term, in adults diagnosed with terminal illnesses. Um, we also conduct research with cannabis for the treatment of PTSD um, and other observational research. Um, um, another word about um, this, this research. So while we are now um, fully um, conducting this research and recently completed phase two about, about the FDA approved clinical trials and are starting phase three. Um, this took many years of work to get there. Um, there are many barriers bes besides funding that exist for schedule one substances, um, including extra licenses, extra bureaucratic hurdles, long delays, um, and it took literally decades of work. Um, I wanted to dive in a bit um, when I speak about MDMA assisted therapy. I wanted to explain a bit about what I mean by that. Um, our therapy model involves two therapists and one participant. Um, and the, before, the, the session with medicine is a six to eight hour long therapy session. But before that therapy session, as you can see, there are three preparatory sessions where the individual um, gets to speak to the therapist and gets to develop a, a therapeutic relationship. Um, then there is a single session with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy um, for the six to eight hour long process. Then the participant spends the night in the clinic, has another session in the morning, um, and then there are sessions without the medicine um, interspersed. But overall, it is a three sessions using MDMA. And this is in really stark contrast to many other treatments for PTSD, which require taking medication every single day and seeing very different results. Um, and after the sessions are finished, there are also um, closing therapy sessions. So these are the results from our phase two study, um, which show that after 12 months, 68% of our participants no longer qualified as having post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which is really incredible results. Right now, the only approved medicine for pharmaceuticals for PTSD in the United States are Zoloft and Paxil, which have about 50% efficacy in reducing symptoms of PTSD, but are not successful in, in eliminating them. Um, what's particularly encouraging is that just after the study, the results are, a bit, are around 61%, and with time, but by a year later, people have improved, which indicates that no, no, not only are these results durable, but actually keep improving with time and, and support. Um, additionally, these results are so encouraging that the FDA has granted um, us breakthrough therapy designation, which indicates that they're willing to work with us um, to ensure that we can reach FDA approval by 2021, where we hope MDMA therapy will be <laughs> prescription medicine. Um, we've also re we've also reached a special protocol assessment agreement with the FDA, which indicates that if we have um, a certain effect size that is 
um, the same or improved from our, our phase two research that they uh, have an obligation to approve um, this as medicine. So we're really, really thrilled and excited um, that we see MDMA therapy coming to the U.S. soon. And, and as I say, the U.S., I'm realizing I forgot to mention that we actually conduct research around the world and we have studies currently in Canada, um, in Israel, um, we're developing, and we will be conducting studies in Europe, um, in the UK, in the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, um, and around in a similar time frame. So we, um, um, so interestingly, um, though MDMA um, and psychedelic substances uh, might seem a bit or what's interesting to many people is that we actually have more difficulty researching cannabis in the United States than MDMA. So though this did take 30 years of struggle and there were very many unnecessary barriers, it was possible to do this clinical research. However, with our cannabis research, though we received a $2.15 million grant from the Colorado state government, the U.S. federal government um, will will only allow us to use one source of cannabis for our research that is grown by the government at the University of Mississippi. Um, so that not only has been very difficult to work with that cannabis source, but it, that cannabis source is actually in, inadequate for phase three research, which is required for FDA development. And, you know, FDA, uh, or FDA approval in the United States denotes medical value, which then, you know, the Schedule One substance is defined by its lack of medical value. So there's a very um, huge obstacle right now in the U.S. to cannabis research in that it's literally impossible to do this research um, with that medicine. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, Italy, which legalized the medical cannabis 11 years ago, has the same problem, but uh, the cannabis we use is not produced by university, but the army. The army has a pharmaceutical institute near my hometown of Florence, and they only grow between 100 and 200 grams of inflorescence. But with, there's so much in short supply that they have not enough to give it to research institutes or university because the pharmacists are, are asking uh, to, to these products to be delivered uh, every day, I would say. And, but we're importing from the Netherlands. I don't know if there's any Dutch friends in the room, but they have a big business. But it's true that this government, the outgoing government, has set up 1.6 million euros to enhance production and another 700,000 euros to import more from the, uh, the Netherlands or elsewhere. I met Michael Kravitz, who is our next speaker of our, from uh, Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access some 20 years ago. And I guess you were saying the same thing that you're saying today. So. <laughs> today you can claim some success. So I'm very happy, happy to give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really uh, leads me perfectly into what I wanted to say to start. But first, thank you. Thank you, uh, Maps. Thank you, Czech Republic, for joining us. Um, I. I uh, started walking the halls of the United Nations uh, about 20 years ago, and the first 10 years walking the halls in New York, walking through uh, NGOs, through the Eco Economic and Social Council process of receiving badges to get involved in the process, which plugged beautifully into the next 10 years in Vienna, where we've actually built a lot of the infrastructure of the Vienna NGO Committee, the New York NGO Committee, the Civil Society Task Force, and the great relationship that we have with the process. The NODC, the INCD, uh, the uh, Commission on Narcotic Drug Secretariat, and the, and the, the bodies, the, 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 the United Nations itself, the member states. And uh, I just want to uh, kind of point out this, this uh, little bit of work before that. And, and I want to point out also, this is the first time, really officially, I'm actually speaking on my issue. Actually, at the UN, I think that's important for me personally to point out. It's been a long time. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, um, I work as a volunteer, and uh, I work with patients around the world, and uh, it's been a hard fight. Um, before uh, 1998, I mean, for many years, uh, before 1996 even, many know recognize the 1996 date as the date that we started on the 
on the path of medical cannabis inside the United States and the states. And you have to realize this was as a result of many, many years of reading research on the uh, single cannabinoids and reading research on the uh, uh, cannabinoid receptor system, uh, endogenous cannabinoid receptor system. And these are studies and, and uh, evidence that helps us understand what cannabis might do. It's not unreasonable for us to think if a study shows that the active ingredient, which is legal in every country, uh, in a synthetic form, not based on plant material, if that synthetic copy of THC is valuable in medicine, it stands to reason uh, when a patient tells us they use the plant material that contains an active ingredient gets a medical benefit, it doesn't seem weird to us. Uh, that seems uh, un unimaginably difficult for our National Institutes of Drug Abuse to get their brain around. And how I uh, became to know uh, MAPS was uh, for many years we would go to the federal government, we'd go to the DEA, we'd go to the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, and we'd say, we want cannabis as a medicine. And they say, well, sure, you can have cannabis as a medicine. Just prove that it's a medicine by, by science. And, uh, of course, then we try to do the science, and they said, well, you can't do science uh, and, and study this plant material. It's illegal under federal law. I, the previous uh, director of the uh, National Institutes of Drug Abuse, uh, Leshner, uh, said it very, very plainly. He said, how can I approve a study of cannabis for medicine when in U.S. federal law it says it's not a medicine? It's actually written in U.S. federal law that it's not a medicine. That's how far they went. And what do you think the United States federal law is based on? The Controlled Substances Act is replete with the treaty. The 1962 treaty is the basis of the 1970 Act. They use it. It's a catch-22. It's a constant cycle. Um, we saw such great experience in 1996. 1996, all the way to 2006, uh, nothing. No, no reaction from the government at all. We have thousands of patients. And, and I just want to point out that there's a perception that the medical cannabis programs are just a ballot box initiative and that it's an open thing. And it doesn't work that way at all. In fact, depending on the state, and each state in the United States is almost like a member state in, in this forum. It is, they're large and, and, and uh, a lot of factors to con consider. But many states take very strong care in creating an entire regulatory structure at the state level to mirror and, and, and duplicate the National Institute of Drug Abuse's job. To, and, and duplicate the environmental standards of the EPA, to duplicate the, the quality control standards and, and, and uh, work of the FDA. And, and we have to create all this additional work just to get around the blockade, this, this blockade. And MAPS has been the one who's, who's led that charge <coughs> to, uh, to un unbreak the seal to, to, uh, to open this up. Um, in 2007, we, we said, this is ridiculous. We're working with the Veterans Affairs Department. They need to consider this evidence. They need to look at this. So we started talking to them. Within just a couple of years of presenting the evidence that we see, and of course some double-blind placebo-based studies. We're not without double-blind placebo-based studies. They're just unbelievably difficult to do. And if the government that is responsible for approving it doesn't like it, they're impossible to do. So we, but we did have some, uh, the California government, after Proposition 215, did some of their own studies. With these studies and with our information, the VA made a policy to allow for veterans to use cannabis in the states under these state laws, even though the majority of their care is under the federal government at the VA hospital. And uh, by 2010, this evidence was so strong that we got them to pass a policy to allow this uh, to happen. Uh, and uh, uh, now, just uh, seven years later, we've kind of expanded some of the programs. We have 30 state laws. 28 of them allow post-traumatic stress for cannabis uh, as a qualifying condition. Why? Because we went to these state legislatures with the medical evidence. We brought the, the doctors uh, that, that work on this, uh, neurologists, primary care doctors, psychiatrists, oncologists. Thousands of doctors have recommended this. They're not allowed to prescribe it. The DDA has an absolute lock on the prescription pad. But they're able, through free speech and the U.S. Constitution, to, to recommend cannabis. And that recommendation at the state level holds the weight of a prescription. It, it holds all the authority of a prescription. And it holds all the, the merit and, and, and our wisdom as a society to use this drug carefully, to use it for, for palliative care, to, to use it uh, in, a, in a constructive way to prevent diversion. This is all embedded into these. And, I, and it's so important that you understand this. I think it's important to point out, too, uh, uh, Natalie touched on it, but uh, I want to emphasize we're looking at this in different ways. Cannabis 
is a palliative. It's a, it's not a curative. It, it helps with post-traumatic stress on a symptomatic day-to-day -day basis. We're hoping, I, I spoke with Rick Dalman, you know, about this. We're hoping at some point in the future, maybe you can have the MDMA-assisted therapy and uh, for the... <laughs> from that, then they have a palliative. And, and uh, it's, it's, it would be remiss if I didn't point out that veterans come away from the VA hospital with a big bag of pills, and they're told to go home and feel better. It doesn't make them go home and feel better. They lead the charge. We lead the charge in death due to these pills. The overdose, the carnage, the, the uh, uh, suicide, the post-traumatic stress medications, just two of them that are available in the United States approved for this uh, treatment, both have a black box suicide warning. And then we're supposed to just guess why our uh, troops are, are dying at their own hands more than they're dying in the battlefield? This is not an accident. And then they're being stuffed full of oxycontin and oxycodone and then withdrawn the minute they try to use cannabis because they filled a drug test somewhere in a clinic that doesn't understand how medicine works and the responsibility and ethics as a doctor. And all of a sudden they're on the street using heroin or fentanyl. This is a cycle. It's a horrible cycle. And, and uh, I, 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 I could talk for two hours on this, but, but I want you to know that uh, the treaty was formed in antiquity. The evidence that it, it comes up with was from antiquity. And, and, and even though we work, I work in three different areas of research. We work in the area of research, gold standard, double-blind placebo-based study. This is, this is the, the meat of the treaty. We can't get anywhere with it. But even worse is evidence, clinical, treatment-based uh, practice. You, you have, uh, uh, how did I write it here? I, I, I came up with a quote. But uh, evidence-based practice leads to practice-based clinical evidence. It's not nothing. It's not an anecdote. It's not someone's story. It's thousands of medical doctors with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients with millions of years <laughs> of experience with, with these substances. And uh, the the... All of this, all of this knowledge falls on the back of the shaman and the, and the, and the, 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 the societies that have grown up for thousands of years who have used this uh, substances, uh, you know, with a, a, a faith-based uh, and, and spiritual-based guidance, trial and error. This is, this is evidence. This is something that we can learn a great deal from. And uh, I, I think that the treaty itself is used to stop Correcting the treaty itself. The treaty was formed when we didn't know the active ingredient of these substances, when they were just considered wrong and dangerous by the people that they were using them and the association that they had uh, with, with these very groups that I have such respect and regard for. Um, and I, I, I just want you to know that uh, this is not careless. This is not by accident. This is uh, work that is being done uh, on very many levels that should be respected by the system. and. The, the sheets, the pieces of paper that they give you from the United Nations are based on what you ask them for. Member states need to be more proactive about their own history, their own culture, their own need of their own society to access these medicines. If you wait for the World Health Organization to take the lead, they cannot take the lead. You need to take the lead as member states to help the WHO have the authority to take the lead. And everyone's waiting for someone else to take the lead. In the USA, we have baseball, and if all the players waiting for someone else to take the lead, then they'll stand there and the ball falls right on the ground in between them. We can't drop the ball. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think in the United States you have this figure of the motivational speaker, but usually the motivational speaker does speak. So we know that you don't always speak well, but also do things, which is actually something that has changed laws and policies around your country. We've heard from NGOs so far. Now the floor goes to the government, our host, the government of the Czech Republic. I apologize, my Czech is a little rusty. So Jean Rick Wolverine, or I got it right, almost. Who's the national drug coordinator, who's a a department under the direction of the Prime Minister of the country. You have the floor. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for organizing this uh, meeting. We just give it space. Um, I'm not a, a psychedelic research specialist. I'm a government person at this moment. I worked in a treatment uh, and prevention area for addictions 
before, so uh, I was not never much involved in uh, in uh, in the research uh, of psychedelics, of course. So uh, uh, everything that you said, I would just echo. So let me speak more uh, from a political point of view and government point of view. Uh, uh, I think. Well, first, I, I would like to say, Czech Republic for Czechoslovakia was one of the countries with uh, rich research on LSD, on uh, cannabis. <coughs> Unfortunately, a lot of the best people left the country. Not so much because there was not such a will, uh, there was not will to, to continue that much, but uh, no money. So, uh, Professor Hanush, probably everybody knows, uh, the person that uh, is behind the cannabis research is in Israel. Uh, Stan Graf is in the US. Uh, these are people who, who started the research in uh, Czechoslovakia in the 50s, 60s. Uh, Czechoslovakia was one of the countries, uh, well, was, was the, the country with the longest research on LSD. Uh, it was the shutdown in 1974, long after many other countries uh, uh, stopped it. I feel nostalgic because I think it's it's a uh, it's a pity that we lose for this, if I so much. <laughs> <laughs> we lose so much at the end of the day. So the best people usually go and, uh, and work somewhere else where the money is, where the money is, of course. Um, I think it's very much what you, what you said. So I don't want to talk about the barriers because uh, much of the barriers uh, I would like to say. Uh, let's see make a political statement, I think it's very much uh, up to the borders of the country uh, to, to make move forward. I mean, the conventions are uh, administrative barriers. They cannot stop us from, from research. As you said, uh, a few of you said it's, it's an economic barrier at the same time because of the complicated administration. Uh, I think it's, it's very important what we're doing here educating uh, government, uh, the administration. We need to do, uh, this is, I know it's obvious, but I'm going to say, this is, uh, this is uh, the only way to move forward, I think. We have to educate the public. We have to uh, work with media. And we need to educate the professionals. We need to work with people on, on the, with the white coats. Uh, because many of them have the the, the thoughts in their heads, that what we're talking is something that is uh, out of this world, it comes from Mars and it, it's, it's going to kill us all. I, I don't know how to say you, you've been, all, uh, you've been all in, in this for, for years and you've been overcoming all these obstacles uh, uh, for decades. So, uh, I mean, uh, Michael spoke about it. Uh, so I think that this, is, this is a good start. But we need to get it to, to wider audience. And this is, I think, it's, uh, it's important. Uh, I think the, the atmosphere in the international community is changing. Um, and there is windows of opportunities to, to start to work. Um, uh, uh, thankful to, to Mars to, to take me to, to see the, 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 the the outcomes of the research of MDMA. I spent, uh, what is, what was it, 10 days, I think, in, in California in the training of uh, the, the MDMA, uh, PTSD, uh, uh, what do you say? It? It was an MDMA therapist training. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think it's very promising. Uh, I think this is something that uh, we should open the door for. Uh, Czech Republic is open. Um, of course, even inside the Czech Republic, we have lots of debates. Uh, we, for the outside world, we are seen as, as a country, one of the most liberal inside. We have uh, lots of arguments and debates, and, uh, and uh, all the old arguments are all the, all the time on the table, all the anxieties. <coughs> and this is one of, the, one of the things that we have to overcome. Uh, let me let me end with a, uh, I don't know, poetically. I don't know how to say that uh, Bible. 
the Bible says that uh, the kingdom of devil is fear. And I think this is actually what we have to have to break to explain as you do in a scientific way what, what actually benefits there are in all the classes. <coughs> when I talk to my students, I do some, some uh, uh, teaching at the University of Social Science. Um, that was my first lecture. I, I asked educated young people, when, it, when we say the word drugs, what do you imagine? And the association, the first that comes to people's mind, death, uh, murder, uh, criminal activity, so this is what we are actually overcoming. And for, for me, as a person from a treatment area, I don't understand if there is a medicine, why not using it? And I don't understand how can anybody uh, uh, take the, the paper of, of the conventions and say this is not possible, because we know it is possible that, that even the conventions, as much as we are critical about the conventions today and that we think that we might need some amendment <coughs> it's not possible in this environment. Uh, still, even under the conventions, the, the, the people who were drafting it were, were swearing that uh, the, there's going to be accessibility to, to, to all substances that we call drugs uh, for medical purposes. So I don't see no reasons why this should be stopped. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not going to happen without you here. Because you have the knowledge and, and the, people, the outside world is scared. That's, 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 the, that's the problem. So otherwise, uh, unless you come with, uh, with concrete facts, education is not going to happen out here to help. <laughs>